welcome everyone to uh, this presentation called Co Common Python Coding Mistakes, How to Can Cause Vulnerabilities and How to Solve Them. So in this session, I want to talk to you about, um, obviously, the, what the title describes pretty well. Uh, but basically, I, I wanted to talk to you also about uh, the fact that uh, a lot of people are using Python. Um, they're using it because it's usually quite an easy language um, and uh, very powerful. Um, but I have the feeling not always everyone um, has security in mind, um, yeah, basically at, at the top of their list, uh, which makes sense. They want to solve a certain problem using their piece of code. But what I want to do today is go through a couple of common, um, common mistakes that you can make, and at least that you are aware of them. I, I, I don't want everyone uh, to, uh, to start worrying, but just know of them, and it will uh, help you get uh, better and better. So my name is Christopher van der Maade. I'm based out of the Netherlands in Europe, and uh, I work for Cisco as a developer advocate focusing on security. Uh, as a developer advocate, I focus on all kinds of things, um, but it mainly has to do with um, uh, automation and integration with Cisco's security portfolio. So there's a whole variety of products and solutions that we have. Basically, anything that has to do with APIs or orchestration and uh, building uh, custom automation and integrations, uh, that's uh, yeah what I'm involved with. Um, so welcome again, and uh, let's kick it off. <clears throat> so uh, to start, I wanted to um, yeah start with a small little joke, uh, which uh, actually a colleague of mine sent when I asked, uh, hey, is there do you have a slide available that shows how popular Python actually is? And we had a, a nice discussion actually how you would measure that. Uh, Python is obviously one of the most, uh, if it's not the most popular language available uh, currently. Um, and uh, yeah, a, a way of showing that was actually uh, um, to use Google uh, Analytics. And we actually uh, put um, looked at how many people Googled anything relating to the programming language Python and Kim Kardashian. And as you can see, uh, luckily, uh, Python is way more popular even though I think Kim Kardashian has one of the most followers on uh, um, quite a few social media um, uh, platforms. So this was just a fun statistic to, uh, to break the ice with. Uh, hopefully you'll like it. Could have chosen any other comparison, obviously, but I thought this was one that most people will know. Um, so to start today, um, I have an agenda for you. Um, and this agenda, um, is uh, obviously not starting with an intro to Python because I assume most people will know Python here. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna start with just some small little comments to set the stage. We'll then talk about developers versus security or SecOps as well. Um, are they friends? Are they not friends? Are they foes? And we'll then go through five different vulnerabilities. Uh, we'll actually end with broken access controls you can see here. But this is not necessarily in any order. Uh, I just, yeah, started, uh, uh, um, yeah, all of these are quite common. And actually, broken access control might be more common than the other uh, four. But we'll talk about that when we go through it. And at the end, I have some final uh, resources and some, yeah, some stuff that Cisco uh, also does, which you might be interested in. Um, all right, so setting the stage. Should I be worried um, about uh, my hello world.py script is a question you might ask yourself or about any of your simple scripts that you might use. So in my opinion, no, not all Python scripts are top priority. When you look at applications that are built on top of Python, obviously um, applications that have any connection to the outside world, like a web application or, uh, yeah, those kind of applications, they might be, uh, they should be on the top of the list when you talk of priority. 
But if you think of an isolated application that doesn't have any connection with the outside world through the internet or, or another network, um, I would say uh, it's less important. That being said, it's obviously best practice to always have security in mind um, and at least know your code's weaknesses. So um, there's a famous uh, quote from, from uh, Confucius, actually in 530 years before uh, Christ. So uh, I don't know how long ago. Um, and he actually said to know what you know and what you do not know, that is true knowledge. So if I, um, yeah, if you can walk away with something today, I would, I would want you to walk away with that to either acknowledge that you don't know everything about security and about your Python script and to be aware of that uh, so that whenever you are going to use uh, your Python script, maybe in, in production somewhere, or again, if it's, if it's a, a production web environment, definitely then be aware that there are um, vulnerabilities in your code uh, use tools to find them, and hopefully some of the knowledge that I'll teach you today will help you as well um, um, to do so. So here I have the OWASP top 10. Um, OWASP top 10, um, yeah, probably is quite famous. Um, uh, so uh, it actually, oops, open it up in a different um, monitor. But the OWASP top 10 is basically a top 10 of um, vulnerabilities, as you can see here. And broken, broken access control was on the fifth of my list, but actually it's um, yeah, quite high. Uh, um, and number one, even on the uh, 2021 list. So I have here in this slide deck, um, yeah, all of these are clickable. Um, I think I'll, I'll share this slide deck in the Slack afterwards, if that's allowed. And uh, yeah, you'll be able to check these out as, as well. But you can obviously also go to um, uh, this page where you'll find um, all of them. And uh, yeah, these are just uh, interesting uh, vulnerabilities that are out there. These are not specific for Python or anything, um, but uh, yeah, they'll definitely be um, applicable as well. So um, yeah, this was just sort, uh, short setting the stage. So be aware of your vulnerabilities, uh, be aware of the most common ones and uh, be aware of what you don't know at least. Now, uh, I wanted to talk about something really quick, uh, which is developers versus security. Um, you sometimes, when I, so in my role as a developer advocate, uh, and also before I was a consultant, uh, consulting engineer as well for a couple of years, I spoke with all kinds of customers. And usually this was sort of like a uh, sometimes friendly, but there was at least some friction between the teams of developers and security. And I just wanted to break that down a little bit. Um, developers are focused obviously on creating features and they want to do it fast. So they have a backlog of features, of course, uh, feature requests, which they need to build. And yeah, usually they only uh, collaborate with security teams when something is, is wrong. Uh, so during investigations, remediations, or when vulnerable code needs to be changed. Security teams, for example, AppSec or SecOps, they, uh, yeah, they focus on something else. They focus on making sure everything is secure or investigating events and making sure that those events don't happen again. Um, so you see some kind of a conflict of interest here um, because obviously it slows developers down a little bit uh, to create features if, um, yeah, if they need to be secure. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, there might be a bit cheesy uh, example, but think of a car without seat belts. So without security mechanisms like seat belts and an airbag, would you drive as fast in that car if, as if it were um, having airbags in a, in a seat belt? So I know it's a cheesy example, um, but it actually does show 
that security enables you to go faster in the end. So if you set up the right security controls, your developers might actually uh, be able to go faster or have less uh, bug fixes and vulnerable code fixes in their back backlog. So uh, enabling them to focus more on useful features. So in the end, in my opinion, if developers and security teams uh, can work together better, um, it will be helpful to both parties. And um, yeah, I hope you agree. Let me know uh, in, in the chat if you do. Um, and uh, yeah, let's now jump into the actual meat of the presentation, which is the vulnerabilities. So the first vulnerability that I wanna to talk to you about is arbitrary code execution. Um, and yeah, well, the name kind of mentions what it is already. Sometimes you also have something called remote code execution or remote arbitrary code execution, which means a attacker can do it from a different uh, machine, maybe in a different network as well. Now, what is it? It's the attacker's ability to run any command or code on a target machine or in a target process. Um, it's one of the most common vulnerabilities in Python. And I've even read somewhere online that it's the most common. Uh, I guess, it meant, uh, yeah, it all depends how you measure it. But uh, at least it's very common and it makes sense. As an attacker, you obviously, this is one of the things you want to do. So you want to breach an application and you want to run your own commands instead of, uh, yeah, whatever uh, the application is intended to do. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, yeah, you can do, for example, command injection, SQL injection. You can do all kinds of things. Um, now, user inputs, uh, so the reason usually is if user inputs are directly passed into st a standard Python function. Um, and usually the cause of this happening is a lack of input uh, sanitization. So that's usually the reason. So let me show you an example of what you can do. Um, so here we have, and again, don't mind the very simple Python snippets. I just wanted to show you that anyone could understand um, how it would work. So here you have a script uh, asking for input, and this input will be um, um, uh, entered into this eval uh, uh, functionality. Now, if I run this, um, and I, um, let me just type, always difficult to type and talk. And I, for example, hand it two times two, it will result in four. If I do this again, and I actually, so I'm, I'm not doing any cleaning here. I'm, I'm passing this into the eval uh, function directly, basically, as you can see here. And if I do this, now, basically what I'm doing is I'm importing OS and I'm doing a system command of LS. Well, we know what LS usually does. LS um, shows basically lists the, uh, the, the, um, the content of a directory. Now this is maybe not what you would like someone to do. Uh, it get, it's still quite innocent, even though I can now I know now what other uh, scripts are also available here. So I can use this same, um, uh, the same method or attack vector to, uh, to maybe look at other uh, information as well. And I can even do something very nasty like removing all, uh, all files, uh, for example, in that directory. So you can do pretty nasty things. Um, I'm not gonna do this one right now. Um, and it's just because I'm not doing anything. I'm putting the input in a variable and I'm passing this on directly into the eval function. So this is obviously a bad practice. It is, uh, it's not good uh, to, to, so to only check if nothing has been entered. Uh, you need to do more cleaning of your input uh, and preferably checking it against a list, for example, of allowed input, or um, uh, yeah, there are a couple of ways how you could solve this. So how do I do that? 
Um, now, as I just mentioned, you always need to sanitize and validate user input first before passing them to system commands. Now you can use a couple of uh, Python um, uh, modules like AST. And AST um, helps Python applications to process the trees of Python abstract syntax trees, uh, syntax grammar, I should say. And uh, basically, yeah, this allows you to, to check um, yeah, what it will do. And we'll have a look at it this in a little bit. You can also use Slex, um, another Python module, which allows you to write uh, lexical um, analyzers for simple syntax resemblance um, of a Unix shell. And so this can also be very helpful to, uh, to um, escape the user input um, uh, by using this. Now, my example, I wanted to show you a, uh, where we're using the AST module. Uh, so we can import that directly. It's part of um, um, a Python, the batteries included. Um, and what you can see here is a function which validates the user input. And we still have our uh, user input here, but now what we're doing is we're ch checking if nothing has been inputted or we're, and we're also checking if um, um, yeah, if it's valid and if not, so if this doesn't return um, that it's valid, we're going to print the, uh, a, um, an error basically. And I'm not gonna go completely into the detail here, but basically we're jumping through different nodes in the abstract uh, syntax tree um, of Python to check whether, um, yeah, basically it, this is some, something like two times two. So we can run this as well. Whoops, simply hit caps lock. <clears throat> and by the way, all, all of these samples uh, are on my GitHub and I have a link at the end if you're interested, even though they're pretty basic, but they can still be helpful. Um, so we can run this as well, and I can give it two times two, and it will result in four. But if I run it again, and I give it a command like this, it will say error, because this is uh, not a mathematical expression, and it doesn't pass my validate function, uh, the user input, as you can see here. So we're throwing uh, the error. So uh, again, um, what to remember here is to um, yeah always validate and sanitize user input, whatever you're doing. So whenever you're asking for arbitrary input, be mindful that there's people trying to use that input to mess with your with your code. And if you don't clean it up correctly, then um, uh, yeah. You, you, you have the chance that uh, yeah, your code gets, or, or your application, or the server where the application is running on, um, or the infrastructure gets attacked and breached. And um, yeah, that's never good. So the example I showed you is something you can do. There's always uh, also more simple ways of doing it with, yeah, basically that function hidden away, the validate function, but I just grabbed this one so that it um, yeah, shows you all of the steps that it's taking. All right, next one is the directory, directory traversal attack, uh, which is also caused by improper user input validation. Um, and uh, yeah, as you basically saw my previous example where you can actually LS all of the files um, that are um, yeah, in a directory, you can use a, a directory traversal attack to actually go back some directories and show, uh, see what's happening there as well. And this can lead to sensitive files being exposed and also to remote code execution. Um, and yeah, usually that's to do with the path of a file access. So um, the path to a directory uh, not being properly checked 
And an attacker could manipulate that path. And maybe you can even go to something like uh, et cetera, passwords uh, or some other secret location. So here I also have an example of, obviously, um, where, um, and I've hidden this right now because I don't have this, um, this file, which could have added, but suppose that there's a super secret text file called area 51. And I'm asking for a file location. And here I'm going to open that file location. I'm reading and I'm printing out whatever is there. Now, probably writing this script, I accept. Uh, I'm thinking that, uh, yeah, the user is just trying to open files which they have access to and they can view from a GUI or whatever. But you don't think about, yeah, them traversing directories. So um, when you run this, <clears throat> and I give it uh, this input, then obviously uh, it will now not work, but it would um, try to open this. So um, this would then be the file location. So nothing happens now, obviously. Uh, oops, I actually copy paste the wrong thing, but. Uh, nothing happens here, but suppose that I'm uh, trying to open a file or whatever, um, doing something with this path without checking the path, stuff could go wrong um, in, in, in this example. Now, how do you solve it? You can sanitize the user input uh, using, uh, again, that slash model. Um, you can also maintain an allowed list of files that the user can access or set up a static safe directory and don't accept anything else. So you can just do a check if the user input uh, of the files is in this list, then, okay, we're going to do it. If not, uh, so we're gonna say, sorry, you, uh, you don't have access or we don't know this file or whatever you wanna do. Um, and also try to avoid the usage of direct paths. Um, now, um, there's also another way, uh, there's also some other ways of how we can solve it. Um, and here I have an example of how to clean up uh, the actual um, uh, file path. And here I'm using, for example, real path. And real path actually um, uh, gives back the canonical path uh, of the specified file name, um, <clears throat> eliminating basically any uh, symbolical links. So basically, and I, I'm going to show you that right now. Um, when I try to put in this now, you'll see that before I do anything, I'm just going to print it out. But also afterwards, you can see that it, it, it cleaned it up right now. So you can use this real path uh, feature um, to do that and to, yeah, basically, um, as you can see here, return the uh, canonical path. And this is, uh, yeah, one of the ways you can do it if you search for, um, for other ways to clean up a path, you'll find many more ways to do it. But at least what is important to take away of this is that, um, um, yeah, users can misuse your file location input to do malicious things like finding an area 51.txt file uh, somewhere. So um, be mindful of that. All right, so we now covered um, two uh, of, the, of, of the first uh, five Python vulnerabilities. Um, let's continue. Um, and I don't, I, I didn't see any questions yet in the, in the chat, so that's good. Um, so um, yeah, obviously, outdated libraries um, is some is might be one of the also most common vulnerabilities. So basically, what is it? Modules and libraries are written by humans. Um, humans make mistakes. Mistakes get patched. Um, now we've. Uh, what we what often happens is we forget to update uh, and test our code with the, those patches. So, for example, 
uh, let me take one of the most used Python libraries out there, which is the request uh, library, which allows you to make API requests using Python uh, with yeah, very little syntax or very little lines of code. Um, now, if you look at the, uh, the change log here and the releases, you can actually see that, uh, so 220 and above is now seen as secure. This might have changed in the uh, last time I took the screenshot, but below here, it's vulnerable. So what that means is when you're using API calls, using the outdated request library, attackers could use this to uh, yeah, breach your application. They can maybe see your author authorization header somehow, and they can use that authorization themselves to do any kind of API key uh, request, uh, or there's a lot of attacks that can happen based on this. Now, usually in, in a Python uh, file you, uh, or a Python application, you sometimes have a requirements that .txt file, and you might have requests in there um, equals a specific uh, library uh, version. And uh, th that is quite oft, uh, um, often what you do. If you do pip freeze, it will output uh, all of the, li the libraries that you're using and you can copy paste that uh, or do the pip freeze into requirements.txt file. Um, now, um, yeah, that can be nice because obviously you tested your application with a specific version of that library. And if you don't put a specific release of that um, library in there, it could be that another time your application deploys and maybe um, a newer version gets installed that there's no backward compatibility and maybe your application breaks. So there's definitely um, yeah, a, a reason to specify the specific release, but it can also bring problems. What if you specified 2.19 and you didn't look at your uh, at this for a while, and it's now vulnerable. So there's you need to somehow solve this problem. Um, and as an example, I have here um, actually a vulnerability that is in 220 and before, uh, which actually, uh, as you can see here, uh, where Python actually sends the HTTP authorization header to an HTTP URI upon receiving the same host name HTTPS to HTTP re redirect, uh, which makes it easier for remote attackers to discover credentials by sniffing the network. So as you can see here, there's a vulnerability where uh, attackers can sniff an HTTP authorization header. And if they have that, they can also uh, obviously do all kinds of nasty stuff. So um, yeah, you can check that out here, for example, on this link. Um, there's a lot of vulnerabilities out there, obviously, um, not just this one for the, the requests uh, library. So there's uh, many of them out there. Um, so definitely be aware of this. Um, and yeah, be mindful that you need to either manually check this or use some kind of a tool. Um, sorry, my slides in advance. Um, so how do you solve this? Now, obviously you solve it by updating to a patched version. Well, that's pretty logical uh, that, that that fixes the problem. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the people that are working on the requests library obviously also uh, look at this and they see, hey, this is vulnerable, we need to fix it. And they'll bring out a patch and a newer version, new release, et cetera. Um, now, obviously it takes a lot of time to do that manually. Um, so there's ways of uh, doing that automatically. So you can use a SAST. Uh, SAST basically um, is a static application security testing. And um, um, yeah, basically, a SAS will be conducted before code is compiled and without executing it. Um, so this basically looks at just at your code without doing anything. 
um, in in the Python world, obviously works on different languages. Uh, some uh, I think GitHub has a certain feature built in right now to actually look to do static uh, testing, and it can, for example, alert you of cer certain vulnerable libraries in a requirements uh, .txt file, which is quite neat that it does that. Uh, but obviously, this is not uh, a silver bullet. You can also use more dynamic uh, security testing. Um, and this one will actually, um, it will, um, 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 yeah, looking, for, uh, actually dynamically test your code instead of just statically looking at it. You can also do this interactively. Um, interactively, um, it will uh, basically assess how your application is running and see if there's anything vulnerable. Um, it will do this in the testing phase which definitely has um, advantages. So we'll do this before it's actually running in production. Um, so there are advantages of this. Uh, the advantage obviously is when something is vulnerable for the specific test that you're gonna do before you're launching it, you're catching that uh, vulnerability uh, before production. Uh, that being said, you can also use runtime application self-protection self -protection or RASP. The advantage of this is that if a new vulnerability arises in your code after testing in production, this can still catch it. So this is sort of the, the final version. So I, I ordered these um, based on how they're uh, testing your code. And this is testing your code in runtime. So where it's, yeah, actually running in production. And the cool thing of this is that it can also actually, or most RASPs can also block vulnerabilities from, from happening. So it really inserts itself inside of the code and it will have certain, um, yeah, uh, um, um, controls over the code as well. Um, so yeah, um, and it will obviously also alert uh, you when this happens. Uh, so again, it depends a bit on how you deploy your application, uh, which of these you can use. For all of them, there's open source tools available. Um, so yeah, definitely check out um, those projects. There's a lot of open source um, tools available. And as I mentioned, I think there's a static, so there's a SAS built into GitHub uh, already. Um, all right, so that was the outdated libraries one. Uh, please be aware of them, it's a very common mistake. So um, next up, we're gonna talk about incomplete and assertions in general. Now assertions are used to evaluate a condition such as a Boolean expression. Now, if the condition is true, it will execute and if not, it will show an assert error. And you use the assert keyword um, when you're debugging code. So let's have a look at this. <clears throat> um, so here we have a, a, a file. And uh, basically this file, there's a variable. And we're going to assess if this variable is hello. So this obviously says hello is hello. So that's true. Here we're gonna say is hello, goodbye. Well, so those are two different strings. So this will give a general assertion error. And we can also do a custom error actually um, when something is uh, false, uh, as you can see here. This, will, this code will never execute though because this one will already throw the error and we're not catching that error in any way. So if we're running this file, You see here that indeed we're getting a general assertion error. So if we comment out this code and don't forget to save as I almost did, you can see we can see the custom assert error here. And now finally, uh, what we can also do is we can actually run this file as well. Um, so one thing I should mention is if you 
run your code in production, usually you don't run it in debug mode and you make sure that assertions are turned off because yeah, there's multiple reasons for not using it in assertions. Uh, it's, it's not practical, it's not good uh, for the performance of your code, obviously. Um, and assertions are really a debug tool. So no reason to run this in production. Um, so if you actually give this, um, if you run your code with um, this flag, which is a capital O, not a zero, um, it will turn off assertions. So what you will see is that this one will now not execute. And you, and I'm proving that because now we're actually entering uh, the print uh, statement all the way at the end. So what is a common mistake is that assertions are used for actual logic. So instead of doing an if condition with a break or with a continue or uh, using if and else conditions to do your logic, people sometimes wrongfully use assertions or the assertions are not complete, which can be very dangerous. And this is actually a very common mistake. Uh, you might think, why would someone do that? What well, actually happens? So it's very good to be aware of this. Uh, and that assertions are usually turned off in production. So that means they're completely useless if you were using it uh, to do logic. So again, it's uh, Python assertions are not an error handling tool, they're a debugging tool. So um, yeah, be mindful of that as well. We're nearing the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna pick up the space a little bit. Um, finally, I wanted to talk to you about the final um, uh, vulnerability, which is broken access control. And broken access control, as I mentioned in the beginning, actually moved up from spot five to spot one in the OWASP top 10. And 95% or 94% of apps were tested for some form of broken access control. And these are, again, uh, just to uh, uh, confirm, these are not just Python uh, applications. These are all kinds of uh, uh, applications and web applications specifically. Uh, but yeah, definitely there, it's a very high percentage of Py, Python um, ones as well. And I think uh, the previous session was actually on Django, uh, Django applications. And I think I actually saw uh, the speaker mentioning this as well. Um, so that's definitely uh, confirmed from him as well. So it's not just me or OWASP top 10 saying it. So there's a couple of examples. <clears throat> Uh, there's, for example, manual app state modifications where you could do, you can modify the URL, uh, you can modify browser cookies and sessions, or you can even use custom API attack tools. You can also do key identifier changes. So, for example, if you have a URL that contains key identifiers, um, then they might change this as such that uh, you get specific access. Uh, which is unwanted, which actually brings me to the last one, privilege escalation. Um, and privilege escalation, as the name mentions, either the attacker has no privilege or it has like basic read privileges. And you're trying to escalate that either to read write or to admin uh, privileges. Uh, this is what an, a very common attack. Um, and this can happen if you don't use, you don't have, um, a good access control management. Um, so here's an example of such a URL where you have an ID, you have an access key, and you have an access secret uh, in the URL. Now, obviously, it's HTTPS encrypted, but a, a, a attacker could play around with this to see, hey, can I put in a different ID? Uh, can I maybe access other user accounts as well? So yeah, you definitely um, need to be careful with this and maybe even think of trying to hide this kind of stuff in the URL, even though an attacker might be uh, capable of doing um, yeah, uh, stuff in a post request as well. But um, yeah, be mindful of that. Um, now, how do you solve it? Again, validation and verification, kind of the keywords for my presentation today. Um, 
So be, make sure that you're validating and verifying, verifying all requests that are coming in, API requests for an application, for example, and have good uh, and, um, um, how do you call that? Um, segmented role-based permissions. So make sure that all kinds of actions that someone can take, make sure that they're role-based and make sure that it's segmented as much as possible so that you only give uh, user accounts the privileges that they should have access to. So object level permissions are also important. So here we can look at an example of a Python script where, uh, for example, that updates details. Now, uh, if the request and the account ID are inputs for this function, what you can do is you can grab the uh, user based on the account ID, and you can then validate if that user, so we're creating that object here, and if the ID of that user object is the same as the ID, user ID object of the request. If so, then we know, okay, the request and account ID where the request is coming from are the same. So that we have done some validation of this request and we can allow this action. Otherwise we can deny it. It's a very simple example. Obviously you can do a lot more checks, but this is at least uh, a good one uh, to do so. All right, finally, I wanted to show you a couple of things. Um, so we talked about a lot of vulnerabilities. I work for Cisco, so I just wanted to call out a couple of things Cisco actually does in this space, uh, which might uh, not a lot, a lot of people might know of. We actually have a tool, which is a runtime application self-protection or RASP, uh, which is available. and You can uh, get a free um, set, uh, trial to quite easily. And we also have more application security tools. Uh, so I would definitely recommend you to check those out if you're interested. Um, so here is an example of a, um, basically a setup of a um, Kubernetes cluster, which is running both private and public clouds, which you could protect with all kinds of tools from Cisco. Now, obviously there's also a lot of open source tools, which you should definitely check out as well. Um, and I have some more resources here for you. Um, and also the Python samples that I uh, talked about today. Um, so I'll throw in my slides in PDF form in the Slack so you can uh, access them there as well. All right, we're at the order to uh, whatever hour it is in your time zone, um, unless you're in India, by the way, uh, then it's a quarter past, I think. The, um, so this is the end of the presentation. I very much would like to thank you for your time. Um, I'll check out any questions that are open and also in the face-to-face -face area. And um, yeah, again, thank you. Feel free to reach out via Twitter, my email, or GitHub.